Hi everyone, it's Megan with Teach Me ABA and we are continuing to make our way through task list five. Today, we're going to discuss item D5, which is actually using single subject research designs. So we'll chat about what each design looks like and also how you can apply that to your clinical work. <laughs> The first one is a reversal, and this is also called an ABAB design. In this design, A is baseline, so this is the data that you collect before you implement an intervention to see the client's current level of functioning. The B is the intervention, so you draw a little phase line, you have your baseline, baseline, there's a phase line, and then you implement your intervention. And hopefully the behavior changes in some way. If it doesn't, then you may need to go back to the drawing board and see what's wrong with your intervention. After we see some stability in the data after implementing intervention, we then withdraw the intervention. At this point, we would expect the data to go back to baseline levels because we're no longer presenting that independent variable that is responsible for behavior change. Then, once we see steady states of responding in baseline again, we drop another phase line on our graph and we start implementing intervention again. Ideally, behavior would go back to the same level that it was at in the prior intervention phase. So this replication, A, B, A, B, is what shows us that there's a functional relationship that's likely between the intervention and the behavior change. So this type of experimental design is great in research because it shows that clear distinction, but it's not always appropriate. And there are several reasons for this. It may not be appropriate to withdraw an intervention if the behavior is dangerous once we see this change and our intervention works, we don't want to withdraw that treatment because that would be unethical to put the person in harm's way again, just to be rigorous scientists. Another reason that we may not want to use an ABAB design is if the behavior is not reversible. So if we're teaching a new skill, we can't just take away our teaching procedure and expect the skill to go back to zero, especially if it's a behavioral cusp. So. ABAB is great when you have a reversible behavior, but it's not good if the behavior is dangerous. It's also hard to get caregivers on board with taking away an effective treatment, and you can't use it for behaviors that are not reversible. The next experimental design is multiple baseline, which I really love because it's so utilitarian. You can apply it to pretty much anything and you don't need to withdraw the treatment at any point in time, so it's a lot easier to get buy-in. There are three types of multiple baseline designs. The first is multiple baseline across participants, and so you implement baseline with all of the participants at the same time. You start an intervention for one. Once you see that steady responding and performance, you can start implementing intervention for the next participant and so on and so forth. So you end up having this staggered baseline where your phase line is connected and kind of looks like a zigzag going down. So if you see that type of graph on your exam, it's likely a multiple baseline where those graphs are stacked on top of each other. You can also use a multiple baseline across settings. So for this, you would have the same participant, the same behavior that you're targeting, but the baselines that you're staggering are different settings. So you might implement an intervention first at home, then wait till you see the change in behavior and make it steady, then implement it at school, and then finally out in the community. The final multiple baseline design is called a multiple baseline across behaviors. And so for this, you may have different topographies of behavior that are within the same response class. So they would likely respond to the same intervention. You would implement the intervention on the first topography of behavior. And once you see that change in responding and some consistency, then you can introduce that to the second behavior. And then once you see that stability again, you can introduce it on the third behavior. 
Less commonly used is a multiple probe design. And this is just like a multiple baseline, but you're not collecting data as consistently. Instead, you're just kind of probing occasionally. And this is useful if the continuation of baseline may result in changes to behavior itself, or if you just have limited resources for data collection. Okay. One of the more fun but also confusing designs is called a multi-element design, which is also called an alternating treatment design. And I think calling it an alternating treatment design makes it a little easier to understand because what you're doing is randomly switching between two or more different interventions and seeing how they have different effects on the same behavior. So for example, you may have a behavior where you want to implement a DRO procedure, but you think it might also respond to a DRA procedure. And so you may say, okay, during certain treatment sessions, we're going to see the DRO, then we're gonna have the DRA, and we're going to just see what the data looks like and how the client responds better to those two different treatments. The final experimental design that we're discussing today is a changing criterion design, which is super useful in your clinical work. It's not used as much as it used to be during research, but I find it really useful to apply this experimental design for things like uh, increasing the duration that a child's working. Uh, maybe if you're working in school, you want your behavior therapist to be able to sit further and further away without the client engaging in problem behavior. So for these types of interventions, a changing criterion is great. You've got a behavior that's already in that individual's repertoire, you get that baseline data, and you just wanna incrementally increase the criterion. Once they meet the criteria for that phase, then you wanna incrementally increase it again. You can demonstrate better experimental control in this study by having a reversal. So say you get the behavior happening at this level, you can do a reversal make the criteria lower again and you should see it change based on what your criteria is or what level of behavior they need to engage in in order to access reinforcement. In our next video, we're gonna discuss parametric analysis and component analysis and those more complex research designs. So tune in next week. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment, and share us with your friends. Happy studies.